I want to make a claim that we have to completely reframe the conversation that we're having about Israel. That it's not a denominationalist true of conservative Jews, it's from a reformed Jews, reconstructionist Jews, orthodox Jews, confused Jews. We have to have a different conversation about Israel. The conversation that we have about Israel is almost invariably a conversation about Israel's enemies. Almost invariably. Uh, the one place in the world where we do not talk that much about Israel's enemies is in Israel. Uh, we have lived in Israel for about 15 years now. Figure that there are approximately, I was never good at math, so we'll round out some numbers here. There are approximately 50 weeks in the year. So if you include Friday night and Shabbos afternoon, there's approximately 100 Shabbat meals a year. Take away a few because you're out camping and add a few because there's holidays. And we're there for 15 years. That's 1,500 Shabbat or holiday meals, you know, very rough. I'm going to guess, and I'm not exaggerating, I'm not exaggerating, I would guess that we have talked about the conflict in eight of those meals out of 1,500. We just never talk about the conflict. We have two kids in the army, one signed on for seven years in an elite forces unit, one is a three-year kind of kid doing his duty but does not want to do any longer. Our daughter did three years instead of two years. Our son-in-law did seven years instead of three years. It's not as if we're unaware of the conflict, but it doesn't preoccupy us. It is just simply there. It has to be lived with. But when I come to the States, which I do with some degree of regularity and periodically stay over for Shabbat and hear what's going on around the Shabbat table, almost invariably the disproportionate amount of conversation about Israel is not about Israel, but it's about Israel's enemies. It's not about Israel, but it's about Iran. It's not about Israel, but it's about the Palestinians. It's not about what Israel was created to be, but it's about what Israel has become because of the situation in which it finds itself. For those of us who start out completely committed to the proposition that Israel makes an enormous difference, that conversation, which while it may be exhausting, doesn't turn us off to the point that we walk away and don't look back. But for a younger generation, for which the Holocaust is ancient history, and I remind you, this is an astounding thing, but it's true, actually, that the beginning of the Holocaust, the Shoah is a better word for it, I think, the beginning of the Shoah is exactly half as long ago as the end of the American Civil War. It's ancient history. To young kids today in high school, it's not one generation ago and it's not two generations ago. It's their grandparents or their great-grandparents. It's a very, very long time ago. And an argument for Israel's importance based on a sense of what happened to us a long time ago is not going to speak at all. An argument for Israel's importance because of, you know, look what happened to the Jews of Cordoba, look what happened to the Jews of England in the 1200s, look what happened to the Jews of Germany in the 1930s. These Jewish kids feel so unbelievably secure in Greenwich and in New York and in Miami and in Los Angeles and in fact in the Czech Republic and in Krakow and in Munich and in Berlin in all sorts of crazy places where we would not imagine that Jewish kids would feel secure. You cannot make an argument for Israel on the basis of what happened to the Jews in Europe. You cannot make an argument um, for Israel on the basis of uh, you know, the Jews, wherever they may live, live some sort of marginal, tentative, tenuous existence. They don't believe that. And for the vast majority of people, you can't make an argument for Israel's existence because you look at the Bible as some sort of real estate deed. God gave it to us, therefore it must be us. Because while we think we have a deed, they think they have a deed also. It's called the Koran. Um, and we haven't quite worked that one out yet. You're probably aware of that. We have to have a different kind of a conversation about Israel in which the conversation is not about Israel's wars, not about Israel's conflicts, not about Israel's enemies, but Israel's purpose. If I were to ask most of you to uh, take out um, one of these kinds of things, and if, by the way, if you have one, it should be off, mine is, um, but if I were to assume it were on, which I know it's not, and I were to ask you to fill you know, a screen with your best claim about why Israel matters or why the Jews need a state, if we were to do a, a Rorschach test or a kind of a quick response, which we unfortunately don't have time for this evening, what I think we would see is the vast majority of people would write something down about refuge. In case something goes wrong, Jews need a place to go. But here's the deal. It's, um, let me change the clocks. It's five of two in the morning in Israel. Now one of my kids I happen to know got the week off, but one of them is in. And I don't know what he's doing now, but it's not at all unlikely that he's out there doing something. And even if he isn't, there are tens of thousands of kids who are. And they're in the air, 
We saw the horrible price of that again this week because things go wrong. They're on land. They're on the sea. They are under the sea. And they're not only in Israel and in Gaza and in Lebanon and actually in Syria and actually in Egypt, but they're in Yemen and they're in the Sudan. Remember the attack a few months ago when Israel took out a weapons factory and then all the lights went off in the Sudan? What do you think we did it by remote control? No, somebody was there doing that. And when motorcycle accidents happen in Iran to scientists or whatever, we just did that by remote control. Ask yourself, how did that kid, and it's a kid, 22, 23, it's a kid in Iran. Ask yourself how he got in there. And ask yourself how he's going to get out. And what it's going to look like if, God forbid, he gets found. The reason that these kids do that cannot be that, well, if one day things go bad in France, Parisian Jews have a place to run to. And if one day things go bad in Argentina, Jews from Buenos Aires should have a refuge. They should. But there's not, that's not enough of a reason for the tens of thousands of kids who right at this moment, literally right now, at this very instant, in the middle of the night there, are doing all sorts of things that you can't begin to imagine. And believe me, you think you can imagine, and I want to tell you, you can't begin to imagine. It can't be about that. It has to be for some greater purpose. And in order to just round this out by way of introduction, allow me the following hypothesis. Assume that somebody said to you, somebody is coming, I don't know, from some country, Micronesia. Actually, we shouldn't make fun of Micronesia anymore. It's one of the eight countries that voted with Israel in the UN. There were some you know, enormous countries, which uh, you know, United States, Canada, the Czech Republic, I think we got. Um, then we got Micronesia. We also got Nauru, which I did not even know was a country. It turns out it's a country of 10,000 inhabitants, which is less than the number of people who were at the APAC policy conference dinner. And so there were actually more people at the APAC dinner than there were citizens of the country that voted for Israel. We didn't have a wide array of countries supporting us. So I use the following example of Micronesia. Not God forbid to make fun of them. They're one of our eight friends. Um, but nonetheless, um, it's not, um, I don't know anything about it. I couldn't begin to tell you where it is. All I know is that it's micro. In any event, imagine somebody's coming from Micronesia and you've got 10 days with them. They know nothing about America. And your job as a pedagogue is to give them a sense of what America's all about in 10 days. You can have them read anything. You can take them anywhere. You can have them meet anyone. They can, whatever you want. It's no budget, no constraints. You've got 10 days. So you'll probably take them to the Congress, and you'll take them to the archives, and you'll take them to the Liberty Bell, and you'll take them to Constitution Hall, and maybe the Alamo, and maybe Fort McHenry, and maybe Plymouth Rock, and maybe Valley Forge. And you'll have them read some stuff by Supreme Court justices about the, country, the values that have made this country great, and you'll get somebody to discuss the Constitution with them, and somebody to discuss the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights. And yes, you'll probably take them to Gettysburg, and yes, you'll take them to Arlington, so they'll know something about the wars. Um, but you're going to discuss probably mostly the War of Independence, the Civil War, First and Second World War, and all that kind of stuff. And the question becomes, and of course, Silicon Valley, and an Apple Store, um, and of course, CVS, and Target, the things that make America great. How much time are you going to spend talking about the wars in Afghanistan or Iraq? Truth is, not very much. Those wars are very important issues for America, but they're not what America's about. And while it is not fair to make the exact analogous claim about Israel, I want to go out on a limb unfairly and unjustifiably and make something like an analogous claim. And make the claim that when you and I think even about Israel's history, somebody would say to you, tell me the major events in Israel's history. You're going to say 48, 56, 67, 73, First Intifada, Second Intifada, First Lebanon War, Second Lebanon War, Pillar of defense, iron, whatever, well, cast lead, pillar of defense. You're going to do it in terms of wars. That's the way we've been taught to think about Israel, and it's extraordinarily problematic because it says nothing about what Israel's really about. Nothing about why we need it, why we want it, why it's changed everything. That's the conversation, it seems to me, that has to begin to change. And what I'd like to do tonight is to actually put out a double-sided thesis about that. I want to say something about what Israel does for the Jewish people, and then I want to say something about what Israel does for the world. Because they're both important. We have, as Jews, a sense that we are actually supposed to be in the world to say something. 
At the beginning of the book of Genesis, in chapter 12, 13, and so forth, God says to Abraham, you know, go to the land that I will show you, etc., etc. All the nations of the world will be blessed by virtue of the fact that you're here. You're here to actually be a blessing. By how? Being smarter? I don't think so. By being more moral? I don't think so. By being more polite online? I really don't think so. In other words, what's the nature of what we're supposed to do in the world. What I want to suggest is that Jews, like other peoples, are supposed to have something to say. And I want to argue for you in the second part that actually Israel is part of the way in which we say what we have to say to the world. And in the first part, I want to talk about what Israel's done for us. In order to focus on what Israel's done for us, this is the first of the two parts in case you're just beginning to fade out on me here. Imagine that we were now in January 1946. Okay? And you are exactly who you are. Intelligent, educated, Jewishly committed, thoughtful, sophisticated, exactly who you are, only it's not March 2013, it's January 1946. And somebody says to you from your perch, whether it's in Manhattan or in Greenwich, and in January 1946, it would more likely have been Manhattan than Greenwich, but okay, northward, northern you know, migratory patterns being what they are, Tell me about the future of the Jews. 1946. You look around the world. What do you see? Well, there's a place called Eastern Europe, which was the only place in the world that Jews had existed for a very long time. The Jews, in 1938, had been in Eastern Europe for 600 years, nonstop. Thriving communities, religious and secular, and Hasidim and Nagdim, and literary and all sorts of things. You go to the Warsaw Cemetery and you begin to see the richness of what Jewish life was there. The Zionist leaders, the literary leaders, the plain people, the, the rabbis, the intellectuals, the journalists. It was an unbelievable community. But now it's January 1946. And when we say that Hitler killed a third of the world's Jews, that's a correct but meaningless statistic. It's a big percentage. But it's not the important number. The important number is if you look at Eastern Europe, Hitler killed 90% of the Jews. It's not that he came close to winning. In Eastern Europe, he completely won, if you can use that horrible word. Hungarian Jewry was deported at the very end, long after the world knew exactly what was going on, and Hungarian Jewry is no longer. Whatever there was of it survives mostly in Australia, quite literally, without exaggeration. So it's January 1946, you look towards Eastern Europe, there's nothing left to look at, except for the big shadow of clouds that still hang in the air over what went up through smokestacks. You move to the center of Europe, you can go to Greece, in Saloniki, they got rid of every single solitary Jew. You wanna watch somebody stutter? Go take a tour of Saloniki, and when they take you by one of the synagogues, ask the tour guide, what happened to the Jews? They have nothing to say. France, the Vichy government gave over to the Nazis greater numbers than they demanded, just to be sure. England, England, first of all, the Jews were the targets of the same exact blitz that the rest of British Jewry been part of, and the other part of their soul or consciousness knew that their government was sealing the shores of Palestine so that displaced persons coming from Europe had no place to go. That's Europe. The United States, I'm sure you're aware, FDR closed the shores of this country. The St. Louis got here, loaded with hundreds and hundreds of Jews who had nowhere to go. It was turned back. People went, sent back to Europe, many of them died. You're all perhaps familiar with a whole array of other ships. One that went up the Bosphorus, well, came down the Bosphorus from, it was coming from Romania, if I'm not mistaken, made its, was on its way to Palestine. It broke down in Istanbul. The British wouldn't let it in. It stayed in Istanbul. There was 900 people on the boat with one toilet. It was supposed to be a 14-day ride. Three months stuck in the Istanbul harbor. The Turkish would not let them up the boat. It's only because of some wealthy Jews in Istanbul that they got food and water. It's a whole long to do. At the end of the day, the British said, we're not letting those people in Palestine. 
The Turks said, we don't need them. Nobody wanted them back in Europe. They towed the boat back up the Bosphorus into the Black Sea and left it there with no motor. The Soviets did not want the boat slipping over to their territorial waters, sent a submarine, one torpedo, it's called the Struma, the boat, by the way, torpedoed it, the boat sank, 900 people died, one person lived, um, he still lives actually in Portland, Oregon. That was the world, and this country sealed its borders also. Canada sealed its borders. So you look at Eastern Europe, it's gone. You look at Central Europe, it's gone. You look at Western Europe, it's a hellhole. You look at the United States, American Jews are studying their shoelaces. They're so embarrassed. And then there's Palestine. January 1946, Menachem Begin is still in hiding. He's still being sought as a terrorist. The British are not leaving yet. The mandate is still in force. So it's January 1946, and somebody says to you, tell me about the future of the Jews. The only thing that you can actually say if you're a reasonable, thoughtful, intelligent, sophisticated, nuanced person like you are is, I think that the greatest days of the Jewish people are in the past. I mean, what other conclusion can you possibly draw in 1946? In 1946, in your wildest imagination, your wildest imagination, you do not imagine what exists in Greenwich, Connecticut. And in your wildest imagination with chemical assistance, you do not imagine Manhattan. You don't imagine a world in which a kid wears a kippah, walks into a Wall Street firm, says, I'd like a job, oh, and by the way, I leave at 2 o'clock on Friday afternoons, and during the month of September, I have 46 holidays, and so on and so forth, and you know, but here's my resume, and, and get the job. You just don't imagine that. You don't imagine a world where people can not only get jobs on Madison Avenue, they own the firms. You don't, in 1946, the world that you and I imagine doesn't exist. Not only in reality, but in anybody's imagination. And the question is, what changed? A lot of things changed. But the question also is, when did things really begin to switch in America? They did not switch in 1947 at the vote in the UN. They did not switch in 1948 when David Ben-Gurion got up in front of the proto-Knesset on a Friday afternoon and read the Declaration of Independence. They didn't end in 1949 with the armistice. They didn't change that much in 56, although what changed in 56, by the way, was the first time that the State Department actually began to say, this country might actually make it. And nobody thinks about the 56 war, but the 56 war was the first time that American foreign policy began to think of Israel as a long-term entity. It did not turn the State Department into rabid Zionists, but it turned them into people who said, this was not a little thing that happened in 48 that lasted. It's actually a, a phenomenon that we're gonna, have, we're gonna deal with. The change was in 67. And the change was in 67, not because Israel won, and not because Israel tripled its size in six days. The change in 67 was because Israel did not wait to be attacked. It was the first time in 2,000 years that the Jews saw what was coming and said, we're not gonna sit here and wait. And we did what we had to do and took out the Egyptian Air Force on the tarmac before any planes took off. And that change changed European Jewry, it changed American Jewry, and it certainly changed Israeli Jewry. It's not a coincidence that it was in the summer of 1967 that Soviet Jews began to rattle the bars of their cage much louder than they ever had before. It's not a coincidence that it was at that point in New York and in Los Angeles to a lesser extent, because it was a much smaller Jewish community back then, but in Chicago and Detroit and places where there were great Jewish communities, Jews began to come out of the woodwork because this was a different kind of Jew. This was a changed sense of who we were. If in 1965 somebody had asked you, tell me what you think the most iconic picture photograph of the Jew in the modern world is, the vast majority of people polled would have talked about that picture of the little boy in the Warsaw Ghetto with his hands in the air. You've all seen the picture, with his dress socks almost up to his knees, he's wearing a jacket and shorts. One of the amazing things about that story, by the way, is that his parents had gone to Palestine in the early 30s, had not liked it, and had moved back. He actually survived, amazingly enough, and the Nazi who you see in that picture pointing the gun at him, was actually executed in the Nuremberg trial. So there is a certain amount of justice, quote unquote, at the end of that horrible picture. But that was the iconic picture. The iconic picture was the Jew waiting to be a victim. The little boy, so innocent, he has no idea what's happening to him, with his hands in the air. But by 1970, if somebody had said to you, tell me what the most iconic picture of the Jew is, it's not a little boy, it's those three paratroopers. 
It's not one boy, but it's three people. It's not a boy, but it's men. They're not in the Warsaw Ghetto, but they're in Jerusalem. They're not victims, but they are victors. In the first picture, there's a gun, and it belongs to the Nazi. In the second picture, there are no guns, but if there were one, you know exactly who they would belong to. It was an entire change in sense of self. What Israel has wrought is not just a refuge for Parisian Jews and Argentinian Jews and Russian Jews and seven American Jews. What Israel has wrought is an entire different way for Jews all across the world to think about themselves. Israel has brought Jews out of the realm of thinking of themselves as victims on call, as people, two people who can actually shape their own future. Now, what do we do with that future? There's actually an amazing phenomenon that we don't think about that Israel has done. We just don't think about it. But the truth of the matter is that in 1900, you could have taken every single person in the world who spoke Hebrew and put them in the building of the Jewish Theological Seminary. You might have to use the tower also, but that would be fine. Certainly in 1850, certainly in 1850, 150 years ago, you could have taken every single person in the world who spoke Hebrew and put them all in one building. Absolutely. Now you fast forward to 2013, there are 7 million, 8 million people in the state of Israel alone who speak Hebrew. Lots of people all over the world. Israel has brought Hebrew back. And you go to an Israeli bookstore, and that language that a hundred and a quarter years ago or so, literally almost nobody in the world spoke. Now there are hundreds of linear feet, feet of linear shelves of all sorts of great stuff. Shai Agnon and David, David Broza in, in, in the CDs, and you know, you name Israeli authors, and you know, there's cookbooks, and there's travel books, and there's Shakespeare translated into Hebrew, and there's Hegel translated into Hebrew, and yes, I am sorry to say, there is Fifty Shades of Grey translated into Hebrew. I'm not sure that Ben Yehuda would be very happy about that, but what are you gonna do? Israelis have to read stuff on planes also. It's an entire culture come back to life. We have brought back a sense that we are not victims. There are no peoples that are really genuine people without their own language, and it is only Zionism that brought, that brought Hebrew back. Until the war, it was Yiddish. A few hundred years before that, it was Ladino. Why Hebrew, by the way? I mean, think about it. The one thing that German Jews, French Jews, Russian Jews, Moroccan Jews, Yemenite Jews, Iraqi Jews, and all those other Jews who came to converge on Palestine back then had in common was that they didn't speak Hebrew. That's the only thing they had in common. Some of them spoke French, some of them spoke German, some of them spoke Russian, a lot of them spoke Yiddish, many of them spoke Arabic. They didn't speak Hebrew. So why not make it Arabic, which was the language of the area? Why not make it Yiddish, which was most came from? There are a whole array of reasons, Arabic for obvious reasons, Yiddish because it was the language of exile, but most importantly, Hebrew was the language of the Bible, which was not a religious statement, but a historical one. The Bible was the book that told the story of the Jews the last time they were independent people. The desire to breathe new life back into that ancient language was an ideological claim. We are moving back onto the stage of history. So we're not going to be victims. We're going to have our own language. We're going to have our own history and our own narrative to tell. There are more memorials in Israel, not per capita, not per square mile, but absolutely than there are in all 48 continental United States. Now, partly because America has the good sense to fight its wars very, very far away, and Israel has the misfortune of fighting them in our own backyard. I mean, literally, this is not an exaggeration. Do you know what our friends did who had kids in the army during the Second Lebanon War? On Fridays, they baked cookies and made cholent and drove the food to the kids in the north. It's just, you get in the car, you drive two and a half hours, you're at the front. I mean, it's a whole different world. It's fought very, very close to home, which has a lot of disadvantages, a few advantages. One of them is, is that we actually live out our history. We were reminded of it all of the time. What Israel has done for the Jewish people is that it has actually made us, I think, and that includes Jews in Israel and Jews in the United States, France, Germany, Australia, wherever you think. It has turned us from a two-dimensional people into a three-dimensional people. It has made us a people with a language, a land, a narrative, all of the things that make real peoples real people. Can you imagine Russian culture? Can you imagine Dostoevsky in anything other than the Russian motherland and in the Russian language? It's impossible. 
Can you imagine great French literature, Flaubert or anybody else, not in French? Translation is, it's not just that the translation can't capture it, though Bialik had a great line when he talked about translation. Bialik said that reading Jewish texts, but he meant any text, in translation is like kissing the bride through the veil. Which is to say, is it a kiss? Yes, it's a kiss. Is it the stuff of which dreams are made? Not in your wildest imagination. In other words, kissing somebody through a veil is a good start, but that's it. And to study Bible in translations, to study, to study Talmud in translation, it's a very good start, and it's certainly better than not doing it at all, infinitely better. But there is a certain sense about a people that you get when you encounter its language in the original that you can't get otherwise. Let's give you one example. In English, we say to fall in love. Right? I fell in love with her. What does that mean? I, you know, I took a look at her across a crowded room, and before you knew it, head over heels, tumbling, I couldn't think of anything else. I was waiting by the phone for it to ring, you know, all that kind of stuff. What do we say in Hebrew? We don't say, I fell in love with her. We say, hit ahavti ba. Now, for those of you who suffered from some, through some Hebrew grammar back in the day, you know that hit ahavti is actually a reflexive verb. Lehit labesh is to dress yourself. Lehit rachetz is to wash yourself. Lehit um, ragesh is for you to get all, uh, you know, emotional, etc., etc. Hit ahavti ba literally means, I mean, we say it means I fell in love with her, but what it literally means is, I came to love myself through her. It's a very different conception of love. Translations just don't always capture it. Those of you who know Yiddish, especially Yiddish curses, you know that the minute you translate it, it loses its potency. It's only in the original language that it really captures the venom for which Yiddish was invented. <laughs> and, if you haven't sp and if you haven't seen Jewish men telling jokes, it's off-Broadway show, it's actually very cute and worth the, uh, worth, worth the evening. But what Israel did for the Jews more than anything is not refuge. What Israel did for the Jews was more than just simply giving them a place to run if they had no place to go. And it was not just restoring our people to its ancestral homeland. What Israel has done for the Jews is that it has entirely changed our sense of self. We are the people now charting the course of our future. We are the people who are going to decide what are we going to do when we face critical issues. I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland. I voted first in Maryland, and then in New York, and then in California. But wherever I voted, I may have voted on certain issues because of what Jewish tradition taught me was right. But I never expected the California State Assembly to vote in a certain way because the Mishnah said to do X. I didn't really have that great aspiration about California and the Mishnah. But in Israel, I'll give you just two cases. When the Sudanese refugees were coming across the border, first by the tens, and then the hundreds, and then the thousands, there's a big debate in Israel what to do. And you would have these talk shows on the radio, actually in Israel they're more shout shows, but they're as, as close as we get to your talk shows. And somebody would call up and say, what are you talking about? I mean, we have to have a Jewish majority here because we have to have a democracy and a Jewish state. These people are coming from a country technically at war with Israel. Why Sudan is at war with Israel when it doesn't even share a border with Israel is not entirely clear, but it's the thing to do in that region. You just declare war on Israel, like all the kids, all the kids in high school are wearing a certain kind of this or a certain kind of that. In that region, everybody's declaring war on Israel, so you declare war on Israel too. It's how you get with the in crowd. So Sudanese refugees are actually coming from a country at war with Israel. They are Muslim. They are unemployable because they don't speak the language. Most of them have no skills. They're destitute. Most of them are looking for a better life. They're not actually fleeing genocide, believe it or not. Some of them are, most of them are not. Just like, by the way, people come from the South in the United States. Most of them just want a better life. Very few are actually fleeing genuine genocide. Thank God, actually. And somebody would say, therefore, we have to worry about the Jewishness of this country. And then somebody else will call up and say, what are you talking about? The Torah says, Lo tone et ager, ki ger haita You can't oppress the stranger because you are a stranger in the land of Egypt. Where did we come from? Where are they coming from? You can't stop this flow. That's what it means to be a Jewish state. Now, how it played out is another issue altogether, but Jews had a sense that who we are and what our tradition says ought to have impact on what we do. It's true of the whole array of other kinds of issues which we don't have time to get into tonight. The other example that I wanted to give was Gilad Shalit and the debates that Israel had, but we just, we're going to save some time and move on. But to put it 
relatively succinctly, what Israel has done is not to give the Jewish people refuge. And as long as we think about Israel being a refuge at war, it is simply a way of thinking about the Jewish state, which is going to have no resonance for a younger Jewish generation. They don't want to hear about war. They don't think the refuge is that terribly important. The Holocaust is ancient history. They're going to say, it's just embarrassing to me. The arguments are old. The conflict is interminable. The cost to what Israel does and makes me feel as a Jew is embarrassing. I don't want any part of it. But if we were to say what it is that Jean-Jacques Rousseau actually said, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who said in 17, 1762, which is before this country is created, it is more than a century and a quarter before Theodore Herzl establishes political Zionism in Basel at the First Zionist Congress. In 1762, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, writing in Emile, says, I do not believe that I will ever know what it is that the Jews have to say until they have a country of their own. That's what Israel has to become in our minds. Israel has to become the place where because it is a plurality of Jews, and it's the only country in the world that has that, and because it's a Jewish country explicitly committed to being a Jewish state with all of the complexity that that inevitably entails, and we'll talk about that tonight a little bit, and I hope you'll ask about it as well, because it is fundamentally a country of the Jews, by the Jews, and for the Jews, with lots of other non-Jewish people mixed in to be sure, it is a place where Jewish values Jewish goals, Jewish ideas, Jewish substance is supposed to be the stuff of which the center square is made. The circle of discourse is supposed to be about Jewish things, and by the way, it happens. Just want to remind those of you who have not ever done it yet, when you get home, to Google Ruth Calderon, C-A-L-D-E-R-O-N. She's in um, Yair Lapid's party. She's a secular woman. Every new member of Knesset gives a little speech and then has a little speech welcoming them. It's a little ritual that we do. And she actually taught a passage of Talmud. When a secular woman gets up in the Knesset, explains what she cares about in the Jewish state, and says, it's about the Jewish people returning to their sources, you know that what the, Jewish de the Israeli Declaration of Independence says about it being a place where the Jewish, Jewish tradition comes to life, essentially is what that first paragraph's all about, is really coming to be. Now the question is, though, why should the rest of the world care? Okay, so Israel has actually enabled us to restore our language. Israel has enabled us not to be victims on call anymore. Israel's a place where we can actually say that what we do on our borders and how we trade back for our sons and how we manage our jails and how we do health care. By the way, not a single Israeli citizen doesn't have health care. Not one. Just doesn't happen. You get citizenship, you get health care. It's like, you know, you go to the hotel, you get the shampoo. It just, it comes with it. You don't order it. You can't get a better deal if you don't want the shampoo. It's just what you get. We don't understand in Israel what it would mean to make somebody a citizen of your country and to think that they don't deserve prenatal care or they don't deserve, God forbid, a heart transplant if they need one or anything between those two things. Just a whole different take. So it's a place where Jewish values actually get played out. That's why it should matter to us in large measure because we're not victims, because our language has been restored, because our history has been made ever-present. I remember, by the way, back in the days when our kids were much younger and they still consented to go on family vacations with us. You know, nowadays parents have it well. They just plug the kids into something, you know, an iPad, an iPhone, an iThis or an iThat, and the kids sit in the back seat, talk to no one, see nothing. So you could have actually left them at home for the same exact thing, but you get to say, we went on family vacation. In our day, in our day it was still horrible because there weren't really enough headphones going around yet, and so they actually fought in the back seat. And so when they weren't fighting, they were actually plugged into very primitive little boxes, and it was one or the other. And I remember driving up the Jordan River Valley, and they were, at this moment, they actually were like, you know, no, no, no. And then finally I said, you know, I don't know why we took them here. We could have just been at home in Jerusalem. I could be getting work done. And I yelled in the back, you guys want to look out the window a little bit? And they finally pulled out the earphones. And my middle son, the one who's now in the army, one of the ones, actually looked outside and saw a sign looking left towards Gilgal. He said, Gilgal, is that the same Gilgal that I just read about in Bible class in school? And I said, yeah, you idiot. And I said, yes, sweetie. But um, <laughs> yes, you moron. That's why we live here. Because Plymouth Rock, as important as it is, and Valley Forge, as important as it is, our stories are at Gilgal. I mean, you think your ancestors rode across the frozen Delaware River with George Washington? They would have said, it's frozen. Right? We waited until the summer, then we went across in Gilgal. 
It has transformed our sense of self. We're no longer victims. We've restored a language. We've made our history ever present. We have to begin to show people that when we talk about a Jewish homeland, we're not talking about a refuge. When we talk about a Jewish homeland, we're not talking about a country only at war. When we talk about a Jewish homeland, we are talking about a people that becomes three-dimensional as opposed to two-dimensional. That's why we should care about it. But there's another side to the coin, which I want to do just relatively briefly. So why should the rest of the world care? And when you understand, I think, that the rest of the world has turned on Israel, by the way, not only because of a little dose of anti-Semitism, sometimes more than a little dose, not only because Israel's at war and the Palestinians are seen as the underdogs in the world, cares about underdogs, and not only because of a whole array of other reasons, but because fundamentally the world thinks that the idea of Israel is a very bad idea. Why? Because at the end of the Second World War, the European community basically decided that the reason Europe had spent the First and the Second World War slaughtering itself was because of the nation state. If only there were no nation states, we would have moved beyond it. So the first step was, of course, the United Nations. Second step was the European Union. The third step was, well, the European Union is falling apart because people don't want to bail out Greece and Ireland and Spain, so we'll give the Nobel Peace Prize to the European Union. In other words, anything to move us from sliding back into the nation state. As the Second World War ends, the international community is saying enough of the nation state, and as the Second World War ends, the Jews are saying what we desperately need now more than ever before is a nation state. Back after this message. The prophet of that viewpoint, that the idea of the nation state is a bad idea, is not Jeremiah, not Isaiah, not Ezekiel. It is John Lennon. Imagine there's no countries, it isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for, and no religion to. You have no idea how lucky you are that I did not sing it to you. <laughs> but John Lennon, in a song that captured the heart of the entire planet, imagine there's no countries, and no religion too. Because we're all one big happy human family. And if only we got rid of countries, and if only we got rid of religions, we'd all get along. Israel is of course predicated on precisely the opposite idea. That religions make us noble, and that countries are, what Jean-Jacques Rousseau said, the platforms from which we can actually express what makes us different. I want to spend a few minutes on this and then we'll wrap up. The idea that we should all be the same is one of the most dangerous ideas that has plagued humanity from the get-go because it's fundamentally an imperialist idea. What people do when they capture other countries is try to make them the same. Look at the Soviet Union, look at the Roman Empire more or less, look at the British in India, etc., etc. It's a whole long to do. But Israel actually says something unbelievably important to the world. That though you convince yourself that you're better off taking all the borders of Europe and erasing the borders and blending the languages and beginning to homogenize the cultures, the truth of the matter is what you're doing is destroying something that people don't want to get rid of. Well, you think the parents living in Bavaria want their children to know the same songs, read the same books, eat the same food, and worship in the same way, and have the same memories as do the parents raising children in Normandy? Are you crazy? I mean, you live surrounded by Christian people, many of whom you respect and like, your colleagues, your neighbors, your friends, but you don't want their, your children to know exactly the same songs or have the same memories or worship in the same way because at the end of the day, it is our difference that makes us who we are. We have pictures of our grandparents on our walls that we hope our grandchildren will still hang on their walls. And the truth is they'll have no memories of those people. And those apocryphal family stories will have gotten diluted and changed over the course of time. They won't be really quite sure where they came from, etc. But we want those pictures to be there because it's where we come from. It is our roots. It's what we want to try to preserve. And we want to try to preserve it, not only because it's ours, although that's a very important part of it, we want to try to preserve it in large measure because it is in our difference that our significance begins. If we are exactly like everybody else, who cares if we're here? It only matters that we're here because we're not like everybody else. And I'll give you a couple of examples of how other cultures can teach us a tremendous amount. 
So if you want to go to Tuscany, I mean, why would you do that? I'm not here to tell you that what you guys have done to your American airports is a shanda. Did I ever talk about Yiddish before? It's just unbelievable what you've allowed to happen to your airports. People yell at you about your laptop, and now you can take a knife on, but not your laptop. That makes a lot of sense. Right? You can't take your water, but you can take a knife. You've got to take off your shoes, but only if you're 70 whatever and younger. If you're over 77, then you can't blow up a plane so you can leave your shoes on and take your lap. Okay, fine, whatever. <laughs> Why would you possibly go to Tuscany? Why not download pictures of Tuscany from the internet and put them on your 60-inch plasma screen? And go to iTunes and download the Italian music. And call up the local bakery and order some Italian bread. Call the local wine store, get some good Italian red wine. Sit in the comfort of your own home. Do all of this stuff pumped into the family room, the media room, the whatever room you call it. And do Tuscany and not see one single TSA agent. You know why? Because if you do that, you're not going to know what people look like when they come out of church. Do they look preoccupied or do they look happy? You're not going to know when they go to dinner at 10 o'clock at night, do they take their children with them or do they not take their children with them? Maybe if you're driving along the roads in Tuscany, we were just in Jordan not that long ago, we're driving along the road from Aqaba towards Amman, side of the road, the little funeral. I've never seen a Jordanian funeral. It's very different from an Israeli funeral. There's no women. Just a whole different thing. You learn a lot about a culture. From look little snapshots. You'll pick up none of that. And you won't, for example, on your plasma screen, know that in the middle of every little Tuscan village, there's a piazza, a little courtyard, or plaza. And on the side of the piazza is a cathedral. And then the larger stores and the smaller shops and the larger houses and the smaller homes, and then it fades out into the hills till a couple of kilometers down the road, the same thing happens all over again. And what you learn is that for Tuscans, you don't build a city in which the church and the public square are not in the middle. That's what it means to live a communal life. They don't think that you build a city around CVS and Target. They think you do it around the cathedral and the piazza. We don't do that in America. We don't do it in Israel. In Israeli Arab village, they do it about, the, about mosques, but it's more than one mosque in a village. It's not one central area. It's a statement about what makes life worth living. After the Japanese tsunami, I remember, looking at the same horrifying pictures that you looked at, I remember one unbelievably sad picture where people who had been destroyed by water were desperate for water. That was the great irony. They'd been poisoned by water, houses had been washed away by water, their family members had been swept away by water, and they had nothing to drink. And they waited on this soccer field to be handed out little bottles of water just like this, which we take completely for granted. And they had painted a gigantic red line back and forth across the soccer field so more people could actually fit on the field and wait in line. And I looked at this red line, this aerial photograph, probably taken from a helicopter, I don't really know. And all these people waiting patiently online, and I thought to myself, try that at the Ramat Gan Stadium. <laughs> right, and at first I had the same reaction as you, like, oh my God, look at them waiting online. Imagine these Israelis. And then I thought, why is that? Why is it that we couldn't wait online? Oh, you're right, we wouldn't. What is it about us? What's happened to us that we can't wait anymore? That we're always worried that there's not going to be enough. That we're always afraid that somebody's going to get the better of us. Were we like that before the war? I don't know. But I know that I would have never thought about the Jewish people that way and asked myself that question if I hadn't seen the picture of those Japanese people. And I never asked myself, what's the best way to build a modern Jewish city? Should there be a city center like there is in a Tuscan village, or is that outdated? And when I go to visit the, a very good friend of mine who lives in Beit Safafa, which is an Arab village in the middle of Jerusalem because urban sprawl has actually now completely you know, over, surrounded it, and I see the way that she treats her, used to be her grandparents who have since passed away, and now her parents, the deference with which she treats her parents. She's a woman in her 30s, still living at home because she's not married. And I ask myself, do I treat my parents well enough now that they're getting on in years? We Jews have this way of thinking that, you know, if only we rib our parents a little bit and, you know, are a little bit edgy with them, we can get them to move faster. We can get them to remember better. We can get them to be a little bit more this or a little bit less that. They don't have that pretense. They're just old in Beit Safafa. And they treat them with real reverence. 
Now, do I want to treat my parents the way Muslim people treat their parents? No. It's not who I am. But can I learn something from those other cultures? I can learn something from those other cultures. The claim that Israel makes to the world is, we are the most prominent example of a nation state that actually says a particular culture is going to be at the heart of this nation state. There will be people who are not part of this culture living in it. They're going to be Muslims. And they're going to have every right to everything that every Jew has. And they're going to be Christians. And they're going to be Charkessians. And they're going to be Baha'i. And they're going to be all sorts of different kinds of people. But we're not going to pretend that what we're about fundamentally is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We are in favor of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. But we are in the purpose of, we are in the business of being a state because, among other things, we think we have something to say. We have something to say about the importance of difference. We have something to say about the importance of distinctiveness. We actually say to the world, go ahead and do your European Union thing. But we warned you, it can't work. Because people come from certain places. And people want to be a certain thing. You cannot take an entire continent and blend those people together. And not doing so, by the way, is not going to consign you or condemn you to war. The wars in Europe were caused not by the nation state, they were caused by the absence of democracy. You can't think of an example when a real democracy, not a paper democracy like Iran or Gaza or Germany before the war, but a real democracy. You can't think of an example when one real democracy declared war on another real democracy. It was the absence of democracy that caused the wars, not the nation state. Now, does it mean that Israel's absolutely right? I think that Israel's right, but that's not the point. The point is that Israel is what enables the Jewish people to actually have a voice and say to the world, you know how those Tuscans construct communal life? You know how Arabs treat their parents? You know how Japanese people wait deferentially? We actually have something to say about difference and about uniqueness and about purpose. And in an era in which the world has swallowed up John Lennon's philosophy, hook, line, and sinker, we're here to say John Lennon was a great singer. John Lennon was a great musician. And John Lennon was a god-awful political philosopher. He was just 100% wrong. And we're here to remind you that our Tanakh, our Bible, speaks about the importance of difference. And we don't have time to do it tonight, but the Tower of Babel is about that. And the story of Abraham is about that. And the story of the Israelites in Egypt is about that. And the very closing passage of the Tanakh at the end of Second Chronicles when Cyrus says, everybody who was part of this Jewish people, go back and build your God a temple, etc. The whole Tanakh is about the idea that different peoples need different homelands in order to say different kinds of things. Now, it may very well be that you don't buy that argument. And man, I mean this completely seriously. That's completely 100% fine. You may not buy the first argument. You may not buy the second argument. You may not buy the argument about what Israel does for the Jews. You may not buy the idea that what Israel does for the international community. They're both fine. I'll think you're wrong. You'll think you're right. And that's what makes for an interesting conversation. But here's what I would like to suggest by way of conclusion. Even if you don't buy the specific claims that I've made about what Israel does for the Jewish people or what Israel does for the international community and what it does for the Jewish people in doing that because it restores us to some sort of prophetic world, we have something to say. So when God says to Abraham, the, the nations of the world will be blessed by your being here, it's not because we're smarter or more moral, which we're not, because we have something to say. It's like the Japanese have something to say and the Tuscans have something to say and the Muslims have something to say. Even if you don't buy those ideas, here's what I beg of you. I beg of you to help me and all of us together across the Jewish community in the United States, in Israel, and far beyond to reconfigure the conversation that we're having about Israel. Even if it's not this particular claim, it's got to be about the same questions. Why do the Jewish people need a state? How has having the Jewish people enabled the Jewish people to be different? And how is having a Jewish state enable the Jewish people to have a different place in the international community? We simply, positively need to engage in that new conversation. The old conversation of the Iranians are bad and the Palestinians will never make peace, which is true, by the way. It's unfortunately true, but it's just, okay, it's there. We have to live with it. We have to live with it morally, 
We have to raise our children to be willing to fight for, for their country when they have to. There's nothing pretty or pleasant about it, and it's a huge issue, and I'm not pretending that we should pretend that it's not there. It is, but it can't be what the country is about. And when our conversations about Israel, as I said at the very outset, are only about our enemies, when our conversations about Israel are only about the people trying to do Israel in, and we never talk about why we wanted a country in the first place. We never talk about why having a country actually enables us to be different than we would have otherwise been, think of January 1946. When we never ask ourselves how having a country enables us to have a voice in the international community, what I think we do is we consign a conversation about Israel to a kind of conversation that a younger generation simply won't want to have. The last statistic that I'll give you tonight is that a couple of years ago, more than a few years ago, five, six years ago now, Stephen Cohen, who works at Hebrew Union College, done a lot of work with Arnie Eisen at the at Jewish Logical Seminary, and so forth, did a study of, young Ameri of American Jews in general. It's a whole long study. It was called um, Beyond, it'll come to me in a minute, what it was called. But they actually asked people a whole array of questions about their attitudes to Israel. One question that they asked, just one of dozens of questions, was, if Israel were to be destroyed, not fade away, but destroyed, would that be for you a personal tragedy? Not surprisingly, those people 65 and older, 80% or something said it would be a personal tragedy. But equally not surprising, the younger you got, the less the percentage got. And unbelievably, when you got to ages 30 and below, 50% said that the destruction of Israel would not be for them a personal tragedy. Throw into that mix the fact that it did not include unmarried people or intermarried people. It's a whole long reason why. Beyond distancing, that was the name of the study. But throw into that fact that they didn't include intermarried people or non-married people, so they got a more small c, conservative part of the spectrum. What you know is if they take in a genuinely random sampling, more than 50% of the Jewish people would have said the destruction of the Jewish state would not be for me a personal tragedy. We can't go there. It's the responsibility of most of us who represent more or less one and a half generations in this room. Our responsibility has been until now to protect the state. And we've done that admirably. And we need to keep doing it in all sorts of ways which are not the subject of our conversation tonight. But I want to suggest to you that part of protecting the state is engendering a new kind of conversation in which the importance of Israel is not taken for granted, in which the Holocaust doesn't color the entire conversation, in which Israel's enemies are not the omnipresent reason for the country to exist, but we actually have to ask ourselves, what is it that the Jewish people has to say to itself and to the world? And what does having a state as a soapbox, as a stage, as a theater, enable us to do in the world? Even if you reject completely the thesis that I've put out about what I think we can say, I hope you will agree with me that it is time for all of us to band together and to work together, to read and to write and to speak in new kinds of ways, to engender a new conversation which enables a young generation to get on board in understanding the critical nature of the Jewish state for the Jewish people, in the hopes that in having done that as well as everything else we have done, we will be able to look back on our own lives and say that because of who we were and because of what we did, and because of the conversation that we began to engender in the first and second decades of the 21st century, we did everything that we could to guarantee and to ensure that the greatest days of the Jewish state, but also, therefore, the greatest days of the Jewish people, lay not in the past, but in a robust and glorious future still ahead. Thanks a lot. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.